The following is a message from Crossroads Church, a grace-centered community in central Alberta, Canada. Now with Palm Sunday coming in in about three weeks, um, if you do the math, you realize that we've been, we've been going through Daniel here on Sunday mornings. And there's actually about uh, five chapters left in Daniel, but I want to wrap this up by Palm Sunday. So it creates a bit of a dilemma, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do today. Today I want to turn to Daniel 9, and I know I'm skipping chapter 8, but chapter 8 in Daniel is a drilling down deeper of what we talked about last week, chapter 7, and it actually is picked up again in chapter 11. So I'll refer back to it in a couple of weeks. But for today, let me um, take you to Daniel 9. Um, I mentioned before that this part of the book of Daniel is a different kind of writing called apocalyptic with images and metaphors and all that kind of thing. Except for chapter 9. It's interrupted, at least this part of chapter 9, with a prayer that Daniel prays. And it's one of the great prayers in the Bible. And I, I struggle with prayer. I'm sure you do. One of the best ways to learn how to pray is to study the prayers in the Bible because they teach us how to pray. One day, Daniel prayed, and God heard it, and I suppose thought it was so good that he had it recorded for every generation of God followers from Daniel's time on. Let me read you his prayer, starting, um, well, let's, let's start at the beginning of Daniel 9. It says, in the first year of Darius, um, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And here's his prayer. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O Lord, we and our kings, our princes, and our fathers are covered with shame because we've sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We've not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we've sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we've not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster upon us, For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we've not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we've done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant for your sake, O Lord. Look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We don't make requests of you because we're righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Now, I I have something specific today from the Lord that he wants to communicate to you from this prayer. Um, But before I get there, I just want to help you understand this prayer 
and the way it's crafted and some high points of it so you can find your way around in it. And then I want to come back to what the Lord asked me to tell you specifically today. But let me just say this about this prayer. It's obviously a a prayer that comes out of Daniel's reading of Scripture. Daniel starts by saying, I was reading the Scriptures, and he refers to Jeremiah. Now, it's noteworthy that almost nowhere else in the Bible does one biblical book refer to another one. Um, Daniel's reading Jeremiah 29. And in Jeremiah 29, God says that the captivity of Israel and Babylon would last 70 years. Then Daniel probably turns to his calendar or looks at the the calendar on his iPhone and realizes they've been there almost 70 years. So God made this promise that after 70 years, he would deliver them. Now, Daniel, it's it's noteworthy that he doesn't just sit back and say, well, I I can't wait. I wonder when he's going to do it. Not at all. He actually prays because he realizes that God's purposes are accomplished through the prayers of his people. Promises are just promises until you pray them and make them yours. God does nothing but through the prayers of his people. So Daniel says, here's the promise. Let me pray so that God will actually do what he said he would do. And then I I think you can tell, just listening to it, it's obviously a prayer of confession. I mean, he's confessing his sin, the people's sin. I mean, all through it he's saying, we've sinned, we've wandered. And when I realized it was a prayer of confession, it made me think of David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51. You remember that one? It's, a, it's, all, it's his prayer. The difference between David's and Daniel's is twofold, I think. David's was about a specific sin. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and then tried to cover it up by taking her husband out. So he prayed. It's a good thing to do if you do that. Um, Daniel, on the other hand, it's not a specific sin, but it's years of sin. It's years of wandering farther and farther and farther from God until you wake up and you don't even know who God is anymore. Like, these people just wandered for years and that's what he's confessing. The other bit that I find so interesting is he uses the first person plural, we, not they have sinned, we have sinned. And yet I searched Daniel and my whole Bible in vain to find any record of any sin of Daniel. Can't find any. But he says, we have sinned. You know what you need to learn from that? He identifies with the people, the community of God that he's in relationship with. So it's valid for him to pray we. There's no such thing as a solitary Christian. I know a lot of Christians like to do their own thing and kind of disassociate from the body. But the problem is, when you come to Christ, you always come to Christ and he has his leprous bride on his arm. So you come to his people as well as to him. And it's intriguing to me that when the people sin, it affects you. So it's always appropriate to say we. That's what Daniel does here. Um, So it's a great prayer. You'll notice the intensity that he prays with. Um, He he pleads, it says in verse 3, in prayer petition, then it says, fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. There is a place for that. If you've strayed far from God, and you realize it, and you want to come back, It's not just this casual little prayer. There's a deep intensity and earnestness here. So he fasts. He he doesn't even have lunch because he wants to keep praying. At the end of it, you get it too, where he says, Oh Lord, listen, forgive, hear, and act for your sake. He's totally into this thing. That's the kind of prayer God listens to. When it comes from your heart, the deepest part of your being, that gets God's full attention. Um... The last thing I'll mention about this prayer is that when he prayed it, he got an immediate answer. Let me, let me just read you the answer. It's in verse 20. He says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, an angel, that's what it means, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I've now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I've come to tell you, for you're highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Now, here's the answer. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, 
to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. No one understand this, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there'll be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It'll be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering on the wing of the temple. He'll set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that's decreed is poured out on him. How many of you understand that answer? (laughs) Me neither. Um, What's interesting, if you study the literature on Daniel, this is far and away the most difficult part of the book to to figure out. He prayed, he gets the answer. But what's the answer, really? Um, And the crazy part is, it's hard to find lots of people that agree. So that makes it even more difficult to figure out what's being said there. So all I can do, um, before I get back to my big point, is to make a few few suggestions about this answer to Daniel's prayer that I hope will help you. Um, One is this. That God sent an angel, Gabriel, with an answer. When Gabriel comes, what he actually does is interpret Jeremiah for Daniel, or reinterpret it. Daniel's reading Jeremiah. It looks pretty straightforward. After 70 years, I'll return the people from captivity. The angel Gabriel goes back to that passage and says, let me tell you what God really means there, because you're just reading on the surface. Now, what does God really mean? That's verse 24. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people. Now that means 70 times 7. Here's the bad news for Daniel. You thought reading Jeremiah was 70 years, but it's actually 490 years are decreed for your people. What happens here is that 70 years is blown out and expanded. Huge. Not 70, but 70 times 7. Now, if you remember last week I said to you, that where a lot of people fall off the platform or the cliff when it comes to this kind of literature, is they actually take the numbers literally. But they're meant to be taken metaphorically. Where else have you heard 70 times 7? Right. <laughs> I think. I didn't hear. I think I heard a mumbling, so I'm just saying right. Just to, yeah, Jesus, he's with these disciples. And they say, I can forgive that guy three times. How many times should I forgive him, Lord? Seventy times seven, Jesus says. Now, did Jesus mean that literally? Of course not. He meant as many times as you need to, you forgive them. Now, here, it's not literal. Seventy times seven just means for a long time. That's what it means. A long, long time. I'll tell you what's happening in this verse. This is the big news that Daniel got that he didn't understand. Daniel, the people have been in exile for 70 years. But you know what, Daniel? Daniel? Not 70 years. My people, God says, will always be in exile in a strange land. Always. To the end of history. Which means today, we're like people in exile. Isn't that what the New Testament says? It says you are strangers and pilgrims on earth. We're like the people in Hebrews 11 that know that we don't have an enduring city here, but we're looking for an eternal one. We are people whose citizenship isn't here but in heaven and we're to live like that while we're here it's daniel here's a light that i want to go on in your head from it's from god gabriel says yeah you've been in exile 70 years and yeah you'll go back to your own land but i want to tell you something daniel every follower of jesus will always be like a person in exile a stranger in a strange land They'll always be swimming counterculture upstream. Now, verse 24 is a summary statement. It, um, it's what's going to characterize history until the very end. Six things happen. Um, and, it, and it talks about them there. It talks about transgression and sin being ended and vision and prophecy being sealed up. Sealed up means the same as you would mean when you put a signature at the end of a letter. Now, I know most people send emails, but in the old days, we used to send letters and sign them. And a signature meant it had come to an end. 
So to seal up vision and prophecy means that at the end, before God sets up his kingdom, visions and prophecy, it'll end. Then we'll see face to face. So what you have in verse 24 is what's going to be happening until the end of time. So in this long period of time, 77s, what's going to happen is someone or something is going to come to put an end to sin and transgression. That's got to be what Jesus did on the cross when he said it's finished. And, and, and then to atone for wickedness. He atoned for my wickedness on the cross. And, and then there's going to be this bringing in of everlasting righteousness, the kingdom of God. And we won't need vision and prophecy anymore because we'll see clearly face to face. And then the anoint the most holy where Jesus is anointed and declared by the whole universe, King of kings and Lord of lords. Wouldn't it be an awesome day? So Daniel, Daniel, my people will always be in exile to the end of time. And it'll be a long time because certain things have to happen. Now verse 25, 26, 27, it just breaks it down and pieces it out. The question is, what do the numbers mean? And this is where people obsess about it and miss the big point. Um, Give me a moment. I think I'm going to sneeze. This is ridiculous. (laughs) I think I'll be okay. It doesn't happen to me. What would you do if you were up here and you had to sneeze? I mean, go back behind the curtain and come back out, I guess. But I think I'll make it. The numbers. Um, Nobody agrees on what they mean. And I think the best way of looking at all these numbers there is this. You're not looking at a prophetic calendar or timetable. That's the mistake a lot of people make. They try and make all these numbers work, and then they try and figure out, well, so Jesus will come about this time. You know what? It's not that. It's intentionally unclear. You know why? Because the point that's been made is that in spite of what we see around us, God has a timetable, and God has a calendar, and God is working out everything according to his purposes on that calendar and will bring the end at the right time. That's what we're meant to know. I think if you get obsessed about all the numbers, you're going to get confused. I think it's enough to know that God has a timetable. He's working it out. History's not bunk, as whoever it was said. Um, It is actually unraveling according to God's purposes. Now, that's as far as I can take you in that part of Daniel 9, because I don't know any more about that. Other people know a lot more, um, but I don't. So that's all I can say about that. Let me come back to the prayer. And here's the point that I want to make today that I I think God wants to lay on our hearts. You should look at this prayer as giving you and me instruction is how to pray when we've lost our first love for Jesus Christ. When you have lost your first love for Jesus Christ, this prayer marks the way back. What's a first love? It's what happened to you when you first met Jesus personally. There was excitement. Does anybody else know this stuff? There was passion. There was um, commitment to the person of Jesus. First love means he's first. I met a kid, 18 years old, a few weeks ago. And he said to me, he said, I prayed. He said, God came into my life, I think. But he said, I've been filled with such joy. He said, he didn't know the language of the New Testament, but he said, it's like I was living in darkness and now I'm in light. And then he said this. He said, does everybody know this? He said, we should tell everybody about this. It, he said, I wonder if other people know. He was so passionate about what Jesus had done for him. That's first love. The danger is with Christians, they lose it. Now, why would I say this prayer refers to that? Well, there's a, there's a church in Revelation chapter 2 that actually lost their first love. What does Jesus say to them? He says, remember the height from which you've fallen. That's these people here. They were God's people, the head of the nations, everything going for them. And now they're captive in Babylon. A great height is what they've fallen from. And in Revelation 2, God says, if you don't repent and bring back your first love, I'll remove your lampstand from its place. I'll remove you from your place. Is that, not, is that not what's happened to these people that Daniel's praying for here? They've been removed from their place. They're no longer there. So I want to talk to you about that because I think it's one of the greatest problems at Crossroads Church. I'll just put it out there. I do think that. 
I believe that as we've prayed for people on the outside to come back, what the Holy Spirit's trying to say is, I want the people on the inside to come back to me with all of their hearts. I believe with all my heart that's what God's saying. This prayer marks the way back. But before I outline the way back, let me give you some characteristics of people that have lost their first love so you can reflect back on it and say, this is where I'm at or this is not where I'm at. Um, One would be this. When you've lost your first love, you neglect God's word, the Bible. You neglect it. It's like, um, it's like you don't really read it during the week, either in the book or on your phone. The most you really get from it is what you see on the screen on a Sunday morning. It's actually like you don't have it. You're preoccupied. and it, it, Truth be known, it's been rather boring to you, and you actually get nothing out of it when you read it anyway that should set off a lot of lights in your head that I'm in a dangerous position of having lost my first love for Jesus. Daniel, it's clear, um, prayed for these people because they hadn't paid attention to the word of God. They, they had it, but they did nothing with it. That's the first mark. The second is that you become captive to godless forces. Captive to godless forces. These people were captive. Now, we're not captive to uh, one nation or another, but we might be captive to lust or to anger or to unforgiveness or to gluttony or to greed, or you name it, or ourselves or power or whatever it might be. But the idea is that we are enslaved when we ought not to be. That's another huge sign that somebody has lost their first love. Um, you feel guilty and ashamed. Daniel prays about that here. Um, You know that if you were exposed and everybody saw who you really were, you would be utterly devastated and ashamed. Um, Fourthly, you have no influence in the world. You're meant to be salt, and I'm meant to be salt and light. Uh, In my neighborhood, I'm meant to point people to Jesus. Um, In the coffee shop I go to, I'm meant to be his witness there. But what happens is, when you've lost your first love, you don't even want to talk about him. You don't want anything to do with it, and you're afraid that you might be exposed as being a Christian. Um, you, just, you just can't even get the words out of your mouth. Um, and I'll give you one more that's actually in the book of Revelation. You've lost your joy. You, oh, you still come to church, for sure. And you still do your ministry, your God stuff, your volunteer in the children's program or youth or usher or lead worship or speak, whatever it is. But but it's actually now a sense of duty. There's no joy in it. You can't figure out why there's no joy because you used to know joy. Those are all signs and symptoms that somebody has lost their first love. So if the shoe fits, let me talk to you about how to find your way back because that's what this prayer, I think, is about. Four things you need to know. And they're so simple. But we lose the simplicity of our walk when we turn away from the Lord. Number one, you need to return to the Bible. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Return to the Bible. That's where Daniel actually starts. He says, I was reading Scripture. And when he was reading Scripture, he encountered God. And he heard a word from God, and it spurred him to pray, and it began a relationship with God at a whole new level. Um, I want to say this. When I say return to the Bible, I'm not thinking about you reading this book just to pile a bunch of information in your head. In Scripture, we actually encounter the living God. We don't read it for information. We actually read it for relationship. Um, It's there in Scripture that we actually hear the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. It was there that the Lord reminded Daniel of his promise and moved Daniel to pray so that Daniel could experience everything God had for him. And one of the first signs of love love gone cold is we, we get nothing out of it, we don't listen, and partly because we're not hungry for relationship. The prophet Amos, he wrote about a time before Jesus came back, When there would be a famine for God's word, we're there. I I know you have Bibles, and I do, and I know it's on our phones, but when he meant famine, he didn't mean that we wouldn't have it. 
What he actually meant was we'd be surrounded by food and not eat. That's what he meant. Um, the, the most common um, question that's put to me as a pastor by Christians, I think, is I don't even know where to start. It, I get nothing out of it. I'm bored with it. That's famine. That's because it's, you've been living on junk food for so long that it, you don't even have an appetite for the real deal anymore. We're there. We're experiencing a famine in the midst of plenty, which is the craziest thing. Now, before I'm done, I will give you a place to start with the Bible because it's always good to know where to start. It's an overwhelming book, really. But your path back always starts by saying, this is God's word. It's not just an ordinary book. And somehow I need to hear it and experience God speak to me personally through this book. Not just pile up with a bunch of information, but personally encounter the living God. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I don't need the Bible. I, he talks to my heart and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure he does. And, and he does talk to our hearts. But you know what? Unless your heart has been immersed in this book, you will never know whether the voice is on the inside of the Holy Spirit or your head or worse, the enemy's. This is how we get to know his language and his accent and his style of speaking so that when he speaks in a vision, a dream, or to our heart or through a prophecy, we recognize the voice. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this. We need to confess our sins. Pretty straightforward stuff, isn't it? Confess our sins. Being truthful about what we've done. Daniel says in verse 5, Um, Lord, we have sinned and done wrong. We've been wicked and rebelled. And what we've done is we've actually turned away from your commandments and laws. We've not listened. Like, he's very specific. Confession means to say the same thing about your stuff that God says. Not to cover it up. Not to make it sound soft, but to be brutally honest with God and say, this is me, this is where I'm at, this is what I've done, and I don't know what to do about it. But to bring it to him in confession. And to acknowledge that our sins have actually brought trouble on our lives. Daniel two times over says, this disaster has come upon us because we've turned away. Isaiah 42 says, because we haven't paid attention to God's word, we, you know, stuff has happened in our life and we are, we are, we're not smart enough to join the dots to say it's because I've turned away from God. I mean, that's, that's what Daniel says. So confession, but confession means not just acknowledgement, but repentance, which is renouncing the sin, to stop doing it and to turn away from it. Let me, let me give you an illustration. Um, years and years ago, before half of this place was born, I was, um, I was parked on a road outside a house where Ginny was visiting, waiting for her. And there was a long driveway with a garage, and I was in the car waiting for Ginny. And two kids were playing, little kids, a girl was on a bike and a little guy beside her. And I just casually watched them. And um, then suddenly the little guy, he, he goes up to the girl on the bike and he kicks the bike and knocks her off. And she falls on the ground and scrapes her knee. And she's right ticked off. And I think, oh, this is interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. I wasn't going to get involved. We're in my kids. And um, <laughs> she, um, she gets up off the ground And she stomps down to the end of the driveway and she puts her hands on her hips and she says, I'm going home. And I thought, well, just go. But she stood there. Meanwhile, at the top of the driveway, he goes like this. He says, well, you know, if you go home, I'll have nobody to play with. She says, well, I don't care. And I thought, way to go. And But they they, they just stood there staring at each other. Then he broke the silence by saying, well, he said, I'm sorry. She said, sorry's not good enough for me. And I thought, whoa, that's, that's bold. And they stood and they stared at each other. And then he um, finally said, okay, I won't do it again. At that point, you'd think nothing happened. She came back down the driveway and they began playing. And I said to myself, I've just seen Repentance. Most of us are so busy saying to God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What he wants to hear is I'm sorry and I don't want to do it again. That's repentance. Um, repentance is the road back to the Father's heart. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, 
He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins because of the blood of Jesus and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's, you, you, can't, you can't get around that. There's no coming back to the Father's heart without putting away sin, stopping it. Don't do it again. That's what it means. Um, so confession of sin. Let me give you the third thing. It's to remember past mercies, knowing God doesn't change. I look at verse 15, and I hear Daniel pray, Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we've sinned, we've done wrong. What's he doing? He's saying we're in a big mess. Disaster is what he calls it. So he says, I wonder if God's finished with us. I wonder if he's about to wash his hands of us. I wonder if we've sinned ourselves into oblivion, or oblivion, but he stops and he says, wait a minute, I remember God's past mercies. I remember when we were slaves in Egypt and he brought us out. We didn't get out ourselves. And I remember how he provided for us for 40 years in the desert. And I remember how he split open the Jordan River and we walked through on dry ground. And I remember how he took out the inhabitants of the land and gave us cities to live in we didn't even toil for He's overwhelmed, I think, with everything God has done. Now, the logic is this. If God ever makes a commitment to a people or to you, he doesn't give up on it. He finishes what he starts. If you can look back and say, I remember God's mercies, it'll give you hope that you can still experience more because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was reading... Um, Genesis 26 this week. And it's about Isaac. This king named Ahimelech came up to Isaac. And he just made this statement to Isaac that just caught me. It was God's personal voice talking to me. Ahimelech said to Isaac, we saw very clearly that the Lord was with you. That stopped me in my tracks. Because, you know, sometimes I wonder if he's with me. I really do. I, 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 don't, I don't see him. And sometimes I, I don't hear them the way I want to hear them. And I go through these phases sometimes where it's just like, where are you? And that verse hit me at the right. You know what I did? I stopped and I took out my journal and I began to write. I went back 20, 25 years, 30 years. I went back 30 years and I began to write the things that were clear to me that God had been with me. Indisputable evidence that God had been with me. And I wrote a page. Then I wrote another page. And I, I could have written a book. And at the end of that, I looked. I thought, that's indisputable that that was God. So if that was God and he was there, why would I think that now he would finish with me? Why would I think that now he wouldn't still want to interact with me? That's, that's the logic of what Daniel's doing here. And so I think what we need to do, if we want to come back to God, is remember what it was like when we were close to him. You know what that does? It warms up your heart again. It's like reigniting a pilot light that's gone out. It like rekindles the flame when you think back to all that God has done. Because when you lose your first love, all, you can't see past your nose. You're just pursuing your own stuff and you forget what God has done. Now, the other thing that Daniel does, which is part of the road back, the fourth thing, is he appeals to God's glory. I'll tell you what that means. Um, verse 17, hear our prayers and the petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on us. Give ear, O God, hear, open your eyes, see the desolation of the city. Underline this phrase, that bears your name. We don't make requests of you because we're good or righteous, but because of who you are, your great mercy. Lord, listen, forgive, hear, act. Because your city and your people bear your name. What's he doing? He's appealing to God this way. He's saying, God, think about this. I know we're bad. So I'm not appealing to you out of any merit in myself. But remember this, God, that your reputation is tied up with me and with your people. Because we bear your name. As we go, so goes your name in this city. If he was praying today, he'd say, Lord, hear me. Because the people at Crossroads Church bear your name. And as we go, your reputation in this city goes. It's a prayer that God will answer because God is always committed to God. Remember that. God is always committed to God. And you can pray that way. You can say, Father, your name is at stake here. 
if you don't deliver me, rescue me, restore me, revive me, bring me back, then what about your great name? You see, it's God's name that's tied up in this whole deal, and Daniel knew that. So there's, there's four things that I think are critical when somebody wants to get back to their first love. They know that they need to stop neglecting God's word. Whatever it takes, find out how and where to read it and begin, not for information, but to experience relationship with the living God. This book is nothing, nothing if it's not a personal love letter with your name on it. If it's not that, don't read it. If it's just a bunch of information, leave it. But I understand this to be, and I've always read it this way, as a personal love letter with my name on it. I don't think of you when I read it. I think of me and God. And sometimes he tells me what to tell you that I've learned from it. And sometimes you'll find that too. But I read it for me. And then confess the sins that you know. Renounce them. Remember the past mercies of God. He doesn't give up on his people. And pray that God would be committed to God. That you carry his name and his reputation out of these doors and in the community. So I'm gonna, here's, the, here's the line I wrote down last night. I was driving... God said, this is what I'm to tell them. It's softer than I would have put it. That's why I know it's God. <laughs> this, is, this is a line. He said, I want you to say this to the people. Can, can, I, can I invite you to return to the Father? Can I invite you this morning to come back to the Father with all of your heart? If you do, you'll find his arms not closed, but open. He's waiting to receive you today. He wants to. I said this before, I'll never get tired of saying it. One of my favorite places in Scripture which tells me about God is the prodigal son. You know the story. He lost his first love. He blew it on sex, drugs, alcohol, you name it. He did it. One day he decided he would come back and he wondered if the father would receive him. He starts back and the father not only received him with open arms, he ran to him and publicly identified himself with his son. I think that if I could have an opportunity to be at the bedside of that father when he was breathing his last, and if I could have asked him two questions, here's the questions I would have asked him. I would have said, what was the worst day in your life? You know what he would have said? He said, I'll never forget how it broke my heart when my boy left. You're a parent, you know what that's like. It broke my heart when he left. Worst day of my life. And then if I asked him the second question, so what was the best day of your life? You know what he'd say? He'd smile. He said, the very, he'd say, the very best day of my life was when I looked out the window down that dusty street in Palestine and my boy was coming back and I ran to him. That was the best day of my life. Some of you are afraid of God because you're afraid of what you've done. I want to tell you, reverently, as humbly as I can, you could give God the best day of his life this morning by coming back. You really could. He would run to you. He's more interested in getting your heart than you are in giving it to him. How do you do it? I'm going to give you a way. It's just a way. I mean, you can figure out your own way, but this is a way that we did in the first service that seemed to resonate with a few people there. It's hard when you've neglected the Bible for a long time, then know where to read, and it's hard even to know how to pray. When I talk to Christians, I always tell them to start with the Psalms. You know why? Because the Psalms are written for you um, to pray back to God. They're, you don't have to think about what you need to say. You just you pray them. It's Psalms are written, so you'll take them and use them when you need them. There's a spectacular psalm for people who have lost their first love that want to find their way back. It's Psalm 85. Now, what I'm going to... I just want to turn to it for a bit, and I'll tell you what we'll do with it. 
Psalm 85, just, it starts this way. You just listen for a minute. It says, You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people, and you covered all their sins. Now, when it says you showed favor to their land, it means you showed grace to their land. It means people. You showed grace to your people. You restored their fortunes. You forgave all their sin. You turned away from your displeasure, it says. And then the psalmist says, restore us again, O God, our Savior. And then he pushes it further. He says, no, no, revive us again. That means light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Show us your unfailing love. And then it says, surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. That means he is so close to people that pray like that, and his glory is wrapped up. His name will become great again in your home, in your neighborhood, in our community. And and just so you know, at the end it says, the Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. God will say yes. Now embedded in the heart of Psalm 85 is this personal word from God to everybody that prays this prayer. Here, Here it is. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. This is what he says. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. He promises peace to his people, saints, but let them not return to folly. So if you want to return today, that's a great place to start with Psalm 85. Ken's going to come out and lead us in a beautiful chorus of worship. It would be a great way to respond by showing God you're serious, by maybe during worship, even after, if you would come forward and just sit on the floor. There's a couple of pews over here. You can sit in at the front. The rest are kind of full. Sit on the chairs. Sit on the floor. Bring your Bible. If you don't have one, grab a pew Bible. Now, I think in the pew Bible, Psalm 85 is about page 547. Pretty close, if it's not. Um, Bring it up. And why don't you pray it back to God? It could work something like this. You could say, Lord, this says that you showed favor to your people, that you once forgave people like me. Would you please do it again? Lord, would you restore me? Would you put away your displeasure toward me? Would you please revive me? Lord, I need to experience this stuff. That's the way to pray it. Just fill it in. Let it, let it guide your praying, but fill it in. And tell God about your stuff. I tell you, if you take that and pray it to him today, he'll listen. That's why he wrote it. Had it recorded for us. Um, this is an opportunity today to come back to the Father, discover that you've still got a place at the table, you still got a rich welcome, and you still got a lot of work that he, he has ready for you to do. So let me pray. Why don't you stand with me as I pray? We'll worship God, and if that fits for you, then why don't we do it? Father, today I just want to thank you for your word, and I thank you that you don't change. Thank you that you've given us beautiful psalms like this so that we don't even have to figure out how to pray. We can take these words that you've heard and answered before, and we can pray them knowing that you don't change. I pray that you would work deep in our hearts and that you would cause each of us to come back to you with all of our hearts and that you would please give us a first love for you like we've never had before. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.